morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 425 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryomedia Network. Yeah. Today, recording day, is Saturday. Yes, yes, this is odd. Saturday, July 13th, 2024, for broadcast on Monday, July 15th. And I did a little time traveling kits, according to uh, the Weather Channel. Uh, it's supposed to be a little rainy when the show is on here at the Beaver Lodge, but with sunshine coming in the afternoon. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, he, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, on vacation, sort of, ish, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, because he's still putting in the time here at the Beaver Lodge. Uh, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today? Uh, well, Mr. Beaver, I am not fully awake, mm-hmm. and I haven't had a coffee yet, mm. so uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. That's okay. a, that's as fair an answer as I can give you. I think I think I'm good actually. I'm just uh, I'm just tired. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, running the roads and, and uh, road tripping, hiking. We did a float down the Bow River yesterday, and I did it oh. in my red red speedo. So, <laughs> fix or it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> This is me at the end of the day. Uh, I'll share this with you in a sec. I gotta find the picture. Here we are. And this is at the end of the at the end of the paddle. <laughs> the infamous the red speedo strikes again. Oh, I had to. I said I was going to do it. I had to do it. Right. Uh, actually, got a little- tiny shorts bringing you the news reports. <laughs> I actually got a little bit of sun on my legs yesterday. They're kind of red and I'm like a sunburn. I haven't had one of those in 20 years. It's weird. Hmm. Oh, I, I remember the first time I got one a little because, well, you know, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> I'm kind of used to it. And, uh, but it was, uh, we were in the Caribbean. Um, uh, didn't put to get for it was the first time I'd ever been that far south. Uh, didn't put together that the sun is different there. Oh, it is, yeah, very much. Yeah, so. so we got off the boat at the first stop and we like spent the day in the beach and like we're swimming in the water, and whatnot. And I, I did like at home, and it's like the day get like severely burned, but it was like that's warm. <laughs> why is this still warm what is this feeling <laughs> this yeah. never happens at home i spent all day at the beach at home in morrisburg when i was a kid big sunny so close to the equator Mor- morrisburg <laughs> building sandcastles i've never been hot what's this hot thing i don't get this <laughs> it's like eee. 
Yeah. It happens. It happens. It happens. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah. Those are some legs. Well, and, and there's the, uh, of course, I've got the, uh, the, one of the scenes from floating down the river. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is, um, let me just share this picture. This I, sh- I should have described the one for the, the listeners. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, on the oh. Bow River. Oh, floating wow. Floating towards the downtown core at that point, yeah. Oh, you see the whole skyline. That's gorgeous. Yeah, well, as you get closer, there's more, but I, my phone was in a Ziploc bag. That's why it's a little cloudy, mm-hmm. just to try and keep it dry. It still got wet. Mm. It's all yeah, fun. It's but yeah, no, you need to do that, yeah. Oh, wow, that's that's so groovy. And uh, uh, the, the other one, uh, listeners, was um, uh, Mr. Grizzly in the infamous Red Speedo uh, holding a paddle. With my life jacket on. Yes, proudly. <laughs> proudly. Yeah. Proudly doing so. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kits and Cubs, there is, oh, so much news. Yeah. Um, listen, Not all we're, the, Saturday, the, we're Saturday doing a show for Monday, right? Because, you know, we need to pre-record for various reasons. And uh, how would I put it? If I had to put everything that happened yesterday up until now because it's like we're doing this 8 50 in the morning so like we're not even like into the weekend yet really <laughs> like nothing well, it's, saturday and nothing sunday has happened yet that that's 10 to added. 7 where i am <laughs> exactly that would be added to the monday's news and this is already a full monday show with everything that happened yesterday it's yeah. just so much news um first one is mother nature yes uh, she's uh, pissed off yes uh barrel was uh I, I think atlantic canada got what we were supposed to get because the winds so somewhat shifted and uh, mm-hmm. like for example toronto didn't get half of what was expected and even us in kingston where we we got rain don't get me wrong uh, but we had like intermittent stops and you know and it was like a day and a half max Right as it was just passing through, uh, but there were times where, like it was it was falling. Mm-hmm. The crawl space uh, down there is like you know the ground is so soaked. I mean it's it, it's humid in there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it right. So we got rain, uh, and the garden you just see like just think like this is the first time we have a garden, right? Because mm-hmm. I didn't know like w- like when you get rain, it's amazing how much it's just like poof, things just pop up how much oh, they yeah. grow it's it's almost like the rain goes directly to the roots first before going anywhere it's just like you come outside you go, holy crap look what happened <laughs> there's like so much green so it's kind of so we're having our, our first like our farmer experience I've been, i grew up in apartment buildings right mm, yeah. you know, I, except for like when i was living in foster home stuff like this but i've never like put my hand in the dirt this is all new stuff um so uh but you know we didn't get anything like this. Uh, th- there are roadways washed out. There are bridges washed out. Um, there's been one death. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, four uh, young children were, four young children, four children were playing in a park uh, one evening and uh, there was flash flooding and one child got swept away and pulled oh. into a ditch. Wow. And they found them four hours later. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, f- there's a lot going on. Uh, and this, I was taking notes and everything. And then I stumbled upon CTV National News last night. And uh when it comes to this, um, there's really nothing I can add. Mm-hmm. So I figured just play the segment. Okay. Let me just uh, get this queued up then, and I will do that. It's not good. No. With Heather Butts. Good evening. The people of Nova Scotia have once again been plunged into grief following another devastating extreme weather event. Almost one year after the province suffered severe flooding, downpours last night again turned deadly in the Annapolis Valley. 
The remnants of Hurricane Barrel dropped 100 millimeters of rain and sparked flash flooding. A young person playing in a park was swept to their death in a ditch. While others needed to be rescued from their homes, the rain washed out dozens of roads, swamped streets and destroyed bridges, cutting off communities. The causeway at Halls Harbor had stood up to the fundy tides, but couldn't contain the rush of water and collapsed. Wow. CTV's Jonathan McGinnis on the intense storm and its tragic toll. It was a desperate search by emergency crews for a missing child. The youth and three friends had been playing at the park when flash flooding occurred in the area. That was around 7.40 Thursday night. The child was pulled into rushing water in a ditch and disappeared. And sadly, at approximately 11.30 p.m., the youth's remains were located. Emergency alerts were sent out last night around 8.30, warning people of the potential risks. The Wolf Hill Fire Department sent alerts too. Fire officials say one tragedy could have easily become several. People are turning it into a spectacle and we need to start taking these things seriously and understanding these are significant, rapid changing situations. Environment Canada is reporting 100 millimeters of rain fell in just a few hours from what's left of Hurricane Barrel, drenching communities from Windsor to Digby prompting emergency crews to perform a number of rescues throughout the night. The weather events in our communities that we're experiencing this year and last year. Well, that's frustrating. And a few years ago are beyond anything that I think most of us have ever experienced it before. Dozens of roads and highways have been closed due to washouts. Some bridges have also collapsed under the pressure of water, like this one in Halls Harbor. There is a tremendous infrastructure damage throughout the valley. Um, we'll re rebuild that. Nova Scotia's Emergency Management Office says the situation in the western part of the province is concerning and they have activated their Provincial Coordination Centre. Jonathan McGinnis, CTV News, Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Off the coast of Nova Scotia, RCMP say two bodies washed ashore on an inflatable lifeboat on Sable Island. It's believed they're the remains of a 70-year-old man and a 60-year-old woman from B.C. who were reported missing last month. The Mounties say the lifeboat came from a larger vessel that left Halifax on June 11th but lost contact days later. It was heading to the Azores. Wow. Yeah, that second thing was just uh, had, had nothing to do with uh, the particular storm there. Right. Um, so yeah, um, again, if you're you're listening, you, you couldn't see the images, um, but um, water is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Most powerful thing on earth, actually. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I have a very, 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 very healthy respect for water. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, and this is sort of, um, a bit of deja vu because last year, July, uh, there was about some, it's about like uh, one year ago, about almost like a week from now or something, there's four people, including two children who died in, uh, water, rain, weather related events in the area as well. Uh, so I, guess is, the, I think the one positive takeaway from all the rain they received, though, is the fact that it will probably uh, help to prevent uh, wildfires. Yeah. Because they got 100 millimeters. That's 10 centimeters of rain. That's a yeah. lot of water. A lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I fully expect that there'll be... a disaster zone declarations and uh, uh, announcements of support from uh, provincial and federal and emergency funds and stuff like oh, that yeah, and absolutely. things being set up for us to donate in the next couple of days. So, uh, um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty bad out there. Um, now, in addition to water, we also have fire. So uh, uh, an ev evacuation order has been issued for Labrador City. The provincial government said that a wildfire had the potential to move significantly closer to the city over the next 24 to 48 hours. There are currently 11 fires burning in Labrador. There's a campfire ban in effect almost uh, 
well, that's for Labrador, so we'll, we'll mm -hmm. stick with that before before moving on uh, to uh, to other places. Um, in uh, Labrador, uh, the fire is so close and it's growing so intense that even water bombers have had to be pulled back. Uh, Jeff Mahdi, who's a fire duty officer for Newfoundland and Labrador, says we're going to protect whatever critical critical infrastructure that's out there in terms of highways and railways and nearby campgrounds. He says uh, officials are also pulling in resources from neighboring provinces to help. About 9,000 people from Labrador City are making the six-hour-long drive to Happy Valley Goose Bay. Uh, Stacy Hunt, who's a resident there, said he and his family weren't prepared to leave. It seems that um, there was a um, a media event or a press conference or something like that at five o'clock telling people that, you know, you, you should be cautious and whatnot. And at six 30, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, we need to get out. Right. We, we need to get out now. Um, so he says here, um, it was kind of a shock because we didn't hear anything about it on social media or radio or anything. I opened up the door to take the dog outside and immediately called Heather and said, you've got to come out and see this. There's something going on over here. So it was quite a shock to see that there was so much smoke. The only place you can really go is towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. Our concern right now is with our elderly dog. That's the la because the line of traffic is moving slower than the fire. Mm. That's scary. So we're trying to wait as long as we can. Um, now, when he's saying that the, the fire is moving faster uh, than the line of traffic, according to the fire duty officer, Jeff Monty, quote, we are seeing extreme fire behavior out there. The fire is moving at about 50 meters per minute. Wow. That's pretty intense. Yes. So it's covering a fair amount of ground quickly. We're going to throw everything possible at this. Uh, yeah. Uh, the mayor in Labrador City uh, made sure to tell people to take only the essentials. That's because this has to be orderly and it has to be fast, right? Uh, it's the second time that Happy Valley Goose Bay is going to be welcoming wildfire evacuees because last month we reported to ten tons of people from Churchill Falls. And uh, that situation was there. The mayor, um, Happy Valley Goose Bay, George Andrews, says that uh, this evacuation is on a much larger scale. Quote, we are a community of about similar population, about 8,000 people. We're preparing to welcome them with open arms and we'll do the absolute best we can. Unfortunately, we live in Labrador and there's not a lot of opportunity, not a lot of things you can do. So we'll do our absolute best job that we can because tomorrow could be us. Mm -hmm. right? uh, officials say that the fire is burning about 30 kilometers west of Labrador City and it is expected to grow significantly closer over the next 24 hours. Um, out in... Um, British Columbia, uh, there are also uh, some wildfires going on there, uh, trying to find the information. Uh, there's a campfire ban in pretty much all of the province at the moment. Uh, that's not surprising. Um, but there are, I think, over a hundred fires or something like that right now in British Columbia. Um, like there's a lot. Uh, oh, sorry. Also in, in Labrador, the neighboring town of Wabush is also an, under an evacuation notice. Um, but uh, nothing uh, more than that at the moment. Um, in BC, there are 600 firefighters on the ground. Um, and in Alberta, there are close to 1,000 people out of their homes, uh, according to CTV as well. Um, because of, um, uh, ah, having to put some of my words, I'm so sorry. Um, there's been over, there are over 150 active wildfires in British Columbia, including that were 17 that were sparked alone. 
Most of them are in the northern half of the province. Uh, and it's been hard, hit hard this week with uh, all the various weather. Um, it's created uh, a situation that there were cold fronts hitting warmer fronts. And uh, according to uh, the fire center in Prince George, uh, over 13,000 lightning strikes were recorded. So, anything can happen. Yeah. Uh, the fires pose a risk to public safety, uh, but uh, there's only a few, well, only a few. There's a, a few hundred people in the BC interior who are on evacuation alert. Uh, there is a small, smaller fire that was started by uh, lightning uh, in one part of BC that's causing some concern because it's burning in a very sensitive area of the forest. About 100 kilometers out of uh, out of Prince George to the east of it, and at risk are 1,000 year old trees. So there's some concern over there. Uh, in Alberta, there are just over 100 fires, or wildfires burning, with about 30 of them deemed out of control. And one of the most threatening ones is in Little Red River Cree Nation, where the northern community of Garden River has been evacuated. Uh, the fire could cut off Highway 58 there, and that's the only road into the community. Uh, nearly about 1,000 people left on Wednesday night. Uh, there's a fire ban in effect of Cross Alberta. Um, but all of the entire um, forest protection area of Alberta is under a fire ban, pretty much. Uh, and fire crews uh, in both British Columbia and Alberta are getting help from neighboring provinces. Firefighters from New Brunswick and Ontario are on the ground in Alberta, while BC is getting a hand from uh, firefighters in Nova Scotia, plus the use of two super scooper planes to help fight flames from the air. Uh, so, yeah, water and fire everywhere. Well, that's to be expected at, in the summertime in Canada, unfortunately. It's just mm -hmm. how it is. And it has been for a number of years now. It's not changing anytime soon. Yeah. So, uh, I think, and I think that Alberta had printed a map uh, out that was, it gets various shades of red depending on how dry stuff is. And like the map was pretty much red. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. And so, uh, in British Columbia, like Alberta had called in help from other provinces a couple of days before because their map was so dry and there was so so little rain expected that they said, you know what, yeah, this is going to be happening in three, two, <laughs> and sure enough, three. So the at least they got people on the ground before. So I mean that 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 is good planning. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, you know, we could say other things about other types of planning that may have created a situation for f there to be so much fuel to ca and gas to catch fire uh, at the same time. Um, I should say fuel and matches more than fuel and gas. But yes, uh, so while the wildfire season got to a little bit of an early start, there in the world, some evacuations, it wasn't, it didn't get, you know, like last year we were thinking like this is oppressive and it's happening. Um, it didn't start as early as people, this intensely as early as people would think because usually the second year of an El Nino or El Nino season uh, is the one that's the worst one and this is the second one. Um, mm -hmm. And given it had started early, we were thinking, okay, here we go. It's going to be like it is now from April on. And fortunately, it wasn't that. Um, but um, it, we, might, we, a, we might have a wildfire report every morning now until end of August, mid-September. Well, up until now, it's been a relatively quiet wildfire season for the most part. Surprisingly quiet. Uh, yeah. I expected it to be different than that, considering uh, last season and, and how this season started. But yep. go figure. It's it's been oddly quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let, you know. I hope it to remain that way, but it doesn't. Yes. It doesn't look like that's going to be the case. <sighs> All right. Do we talk about Pierre Polyev and oh. his statement about drug dens? 
Do we talk about it? Do we address it? We need to address it. I just wish that he would stop making so much damn news. I'm so yeah, I tired of talking of that little prick. Yeah, uh, I'm sick of him. I'm sick of him. But it's like we got to address it because he went on a rant. And uh, his typical style is so confrontational uh, when he's asked a question that he doesn't like. And then, of course, he runs away shortly thereafter. He's just, uh, he is not the kind of person I want leading the country. Forget about, forget about, I mean, just setting aside how, how his politics are and, and his sort of evangelical bent on things are. If we set that aside and just look at the way he responds to reporters when they ask him tough to semi-tough questions, he's just a, an obstinate, uh, smug, argumentative asshole. It's, this is not a, this is not statesmanship. This is not a leader. This is not somebody I want running our country. And again, I'm taking away all of the politics stuff, just the way he is with people. Now, if we get into the politics, I mean, we can go on for days about that. But the way he treats reporters with such disdain, he's just a smug, arrogant narcissist who basically insists that he's right about everything, you're wrong about everything, and it doesn't matter what kind of valid proof you show him that he's wrong he's going to argue with you and tell you he isn't because he's a narcissist prick yeah it's as simple as that yep yeah. it's just oh he's just an obnoxious smug asshole i i cannot stand him for and again i'm taking the politics out of it it's just the way he behaves when he talks to people so the, the thing with Padilla when we're talking about this is i made this comment the other day is there's been no evolution no. at all. The person he is now is the person he was 20 years ago when he came in. He's There's been, been like no this evolution. University. None. He's, been, he's the same guy. I, had, I just talk, talked to a friend a couple of weeks ago, and he said he's exactly the same as he was in university. He hasn't changed a bit. He hasn't grown. He hasn't moved. He's just the same arrogant, smug, obnoxious asshole he's always been. He's not changing, and he doesn't care to. No. Um, so, yeah. Even though Canada's first supervision consumption site opened in Vancouver more 20, than 20 22? years ago. I think it was yeah. 2003, 2002. I think so. Like yeah, 2003, I think, yeah. It's over 20 uh, years ago. Or maybe, maybe even earlier than that. No, yes, 2003, I think, yeah, was the first one was opened. And since then, now there are nearly 40 safe consumption sites in operation across the country with more proposed. First opened in 2003, you were right, Mr. Grizzly. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, the Supreme Court ruled that closing it would strip users of their charter rights. Simple as that, right? Right. Because Stephen Harper already led this fight. Yep. And all the scientific data said that these things do work. Harm reduction does do work. It saves lives. It's also a portal of entry. Mm -hmm. Guy Felicella. Mm -hmm. okay, so we'd love to get on the sober. show at one time like this. It, uh, overdosed mm -hmm. and was saved there. And that's where, where the light went on. It says, finally, you know, it's like, I got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's a, port, it's a port of entry. He keeps on saying this we're going to cut these things because they're wacko policies this and we're going to bring our loved ones home the only way he's going to bring the loved ones home are in body bags yeah simple as that because he has no he, he refuses to believe the science because he, because the narcissist that he is it's not Listen, his science. He says they have to bring them home clean, which means that it has to have the treatment centers, but that's a costly social program. He doesn't believe in those. Right. He's going to bring them home in body bags. That's it. Yes. <sighs> and if you're not ready to go too into one, then I guess you're on your own. You get one shot. That's yeah. when we pick you up. Do you want to, do we want to go to a treatment center? I'm not ready to do that yet. Okay. Back on the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because there's no other points of intake unless you to turn, unless he turns around and says, well, you know, he, he is prepared to uh, invoke the notwithstanding clause when it comes to people's rights. So, um, yeah, forced treatment. Here you go. 
Well, he went off on a tangent about how he called them drug dens. Yes. And said that he was going to close them. Any any of them that are near uh, schools or playgrounds, he was going to close. Yes. Now. Are, are any of them near schools and playgrounds? It seems the one that he was at is. Oh. Okay. Now, this really surprises me. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if this is a new school that was built after the other one got, or, or what it is. But back in the early days when medical marijuana was, you had to apply to Health Canada to get your mm-hmm. license for it, for right. those who needed it for medical purposes, when you filled out that application, you had to write what it is that you were going to do to keep that stuff right. away. Like, just, you know, it's like I have a like, filing cabinet or I have a safe and I'm locking it in. You know, you had to like specifically say and you had to have that. It's similar to gun laws. Yes. Yes. And if you lived within X number of meters of a school or whatnot, you would not get that license. Right. I guess. So the, I know that there are, there are rules and regulations about where they need to be. So that's why I'm wondering, is this like a newer neighborhood or whatnot, or they, like, they tore down an old school and built a new one somewhere else? And the, and the place was there first because it's been since 2003. So it is possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and now it is within. And now people are saying, you know, it's like we, the, the neighborhood uh, in Ottawa where the, the condo is. There's mm-hmm. the Salvation Army. Mm-hmm. Well, there are people that bought there, and then, like a couple, three months after, it was like, um, "There's this Salvation Army thing," and they're like, "Most <laughs> people," and it's like really bringing down the property value. It's like they were there first, dude. They were there first. <laughs> they were there a long time like, before they put a shovel in the ground. It's like you moved there. Yeah, they didn't move into your terror. Like, yeah, it's like yes, we moved in now, and. Um, yeah, the, uh, we don't like seeing this. So can you move that, please? That's like the folks who who, who uh, buy a home near the airport and complain about the, the flight paths of the aircraft. Mm-hmm. The people who move above a bar and complain about the noise. The people that move into the Glebe close to the campground, close to where the Civic Center is and complain when there were concerts said during the nine days of Super X. Yeah. I'm it's sorry. Like, Sorry. We live right close to the Memorial Center. It's like when the Poutine Fest and the Midway mm-hmm. comes like this, we get the reverb rolls and it's like, well, it's like you want to live within 10 minutes walk of a grocery store, but still have a house. Yeah. There's going to be a little boom, boom music now and then. It just, it's, just, <laughs> it's, just, it's part of living in a community. These things happen. You know? Right? So at least you know when we go to poutine fest like this and the craft beer festival or rib fest and the craft beer festival combined like this and we need to stagger our way home even though it's slightly uphill it is only one block <laughs> advantages <laughs> silver linings no <laughs> all right so yeah um the way that he talks, right, on this one, is like if he's saying like the ones that are close to schools, what well, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm going to close them or move them or whatnot, or not fund them, fine. Because, but it's kind of mixed up, right? He's like sometimes he puts the other qualifier and then another sentence he doesn't. So in another sentence, it's sort of serious, like he's just, I'm, I'm just going to close them all. Yeah, I'm going to cut the funding to them to them all, and then another ones, it's the ones that are closer. So. It's almost like with him, I don't say that anything's an accident. So I'm guessing that the, that it's not stated the same way every time he states it is so that he can pick the clip that he wants. Um, but yeah, he is, uh, he goes, uh, I will be closing them. We will close them. And yeah. Well, here I have a clip of him responding to a reporter from the Globe and Mail, a question, and just you just have to. I, I'll just show it. It's it's astonishing to me his behavior. Watch this. Eric Andrew G, Globe and Mail. Um, your party hasn't actually said what your policy towards safe injection sites will be. So you want to close 
this one, but will you close others? What, what, what will you do around safe injection sites across the country? I will be closing them. We will close safe, safe injection sites next to schools, playgrounds, uh, anywhere else that they endanger the public and take lives. We will defund. By the way, they're not safe injection sites. I'm sorry. I used your dishonest language. See, you just repeat the language that is fed to you by the government. Are you a CP? Are you a CP? Oh, fuck off. Exactly. Who are you with? Globe Mail. You're with the Globe Mail. You guys repeat the same language you get from the, the liberal, the, the radical liberal NDP activists and bureaucracies. You call them safe. How can they be safe? You think it's safe when a bullet comes flying out of one of these sites to kill a mother in Toronto? Do you think that's safe? You think it's safe to have people using crack and heroin and cocaine ne next to a playground like this? You think that's safe? It's not safe. They're drug dens. They're drug dens. And they've made everything worse. Everywhere they've been done, they've made everything worse. And I know what you'll do now. You'll now go and call the same bureaucrats who caused the, the chaos, and you'll call them experts. The people who caused the 400% increase in drug overdose deaths in Vancouver, you're going to call them experts. They are experts at destroying communities and ending lives, but at perpetuating their own industries. Because that's what they are. They are industries that want to expand, and the only way they can continue to exist is by keeping the misery going. So they're not safe. They are unsafe injection sites. They are drug dens, and we oppose them. The Supreme Court has been very clear that you, there's not, these radical bureaucrats don't have the right to open these drug dens anywhere they want. The court made it clear okay, yeah. that there are reasonable restrictions that can be placed on them. And that includes playgrounds. So if, I'll be, I, I've told you my policy. I'm against the drug dens next to children's playgrounds, schools, other places where people who are vulnerable in the community live. We will defund them. We will not, there will not be a single taxpayer dollar of, from the poly of government going to drug dens. Every single penny will go to treatment and recovery services to bring our loved ones home drug free. So like, okay, wait, hang on. I gotta, I gotta back that up. There's another extension to that clip that you have to see because okay he really gets super obnoxious okay. like, the whole cp thing the, yeah, that thing is just that's just that that's because he he has nothing so exactly. he's trying to make that make the article the, his appearance about something else so we'll just just watch this we'll go to treatment and recovery services to bring our loved ones home drug free thank you okay merci. nice try nice try the supreme court didn't say that See, I know what you're trying to do. The Supreme Court I'm didn't. No, I, I'm, I, I'm giving you my answer. The Supreme Court did not say that that, that there can be. So it's, it's okay. The Supreme Court <laughs> like, didn't say that you can have a drug den wherever you want. It said that there are reasonable restrictions that can be placed to stop them from opening up in place in, in locations that endanger the community or where there is community opposition that's what the supreme court actually said now i know that wacko politicians and the liberals and the ndp and their supporters in the media want to make it sound like there is a constitutional obligation that we allow these drug dens anywhere they want to go up no that is not true that is the opposite of true we have the power under section 56.1 of the Controlled Substance, Drugs and Substances Act to reject these, these drug dens and shut them down where they endanger the public, and that's what I will do. <sighs> like, okay. like, just, just. So I'm look, reading an article, and it seems that this is a recent thing because uh, it's uh, the House. Uh, opened in April. Oh. So how was it able to open where it did then is the curious thing. Yes. Now also, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't, aren't these uh, 
Aren't these provincial? Doesn't this fall under provincial jurisdiction? Um, I'm Municipal not and provincial? sure. What, I'm not sure because I think there needs to be some type of federal license. Yeah. Of some type, but I would I would suspect that it was a provincial government initiative to actually started open. under British Columbia, right? Right, because yes, because that's how it happened. So yeah, I'm guessing that it would, it would be provincial thing. Yes, because Saskatchewan does have a safe injection site, but the, the, the provincial government does nothing. They raise all their money selling T-shirts. So so let me see if I understand this correctly. He's going to overstep his jurisdictional boundary guideline. To, to meddle with the province. Isn't this the guy who says, you said, know, less government, this, you know, like the... <laughs> and said he was going to leave the provinces due. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this guy just says whatever the hell he wants to suit the moment. Yep, indeed. Um, so, according to this article here from the CBC that I have uh, in front of me, he says... Uh, at a news conference in a small park that borders both the center and the school party, I've said other federal parties and their supporters in the media want to make it sound like there's a constitutional obligation to allow supervised consumption sites to open anywhere. Uh, okay. Uh, nobody has ever, 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 ever no. once. He's trying to make, he's trying to open. create a story here that doesn't exist. I mean, why that one opened where it did, I don't know. That seems to be odd to me. Yeah. But, He's he's trying to paint every single location with the same brush. Yeah. And again, he just keeps calling them drug dens, not safe, not supervised injection sites. Right. It's a drug den to him. And I'm like, so, oh. Podiev, quote, kids should not have to cohabitate with hard drug use and crime under Section 56.1 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. The government has the power to accept or refuse a supervised consumption site. Absolutely. That that's absolutely true. In June, the conservative leader sent a letter to the federal health minister, Mark Holland, recommend, requesting that the government revoke the exemption it granted to the center to open a Montreal southwestern Saint neighborhood. Okay. So this is an exemption, it, and it opened in April. He charged that the government's policies supported by the Bloc Québécois have increased feelings of insecurity and homelessness throughout Quebec. Andréanne Desilets, executive director of uh, the house in question, uh, said in the statement Friday that the center is working with the regional health authority, the, the municipal government, and other stakeholders to ensure services are sustainable, integrated in the sector. Uh, now, uh, the house in question uh, contains 36 studio apartments, a kitchen, and a drop-in center for people who are transitioning out of homelessness. Right. Uh, she so says, this is done at a municipal level uh, under provincial jurisdiction, correct? Yes, yes. She says, the mission of the house is to support the most vulnerable people in our society and has been a key player in the community for 75 years, she said, adding that the center did not want to, quote, enter into the political debate. Quote, we want to reiterate that the services we offer are essential to responding to the increases in homelessness and the overdose crisis. A spokesperson from the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, Federal <sighs> Minister uh, of Mental Health, Health and Addictions, Yara Sachs, said in an email Friday that while Ottawa does not provide core funding to supervised consumption sites, so I don't know what funding he's going to cut. How's he going to cut funding when they don't fund it? But that, again, action for action's sake. Yeah. One of the 14 characteristics of fascism. Say you're going to do something, get into power and pass a law saying that something that's already illegal or something that's already not happening can't happen. And then pat yourself on the back for doing it. Right? He doesn't know that he doesn't know that the average person who's working you know, 45 hour weeks has 2.4 kids, a picket fence and a dog. Right? Or the person working at the grocery store for minimum wage and then going to their next job and then their next job like this. He knows they don't have time to go and check whether or not there's four core funding to save consumption sites He's relying upon provided by the federal they're, government. They're, they're, Just suggest that there is and let the rest well, yeah. happen on its own. Yeah, and then he's, he's, relying, says, he, he's relying on people who don't have the time to verify what he's saying. Yeah. So he'll just go ahead and lie because he can yeah. get away with it. And when he gets called out by it, for it by, by reporters, he attacks them. 
Yeah. And then immediately goes, you're with CP? You're with Canadian Press? He identified himself as a with global of the Globe and Mail. Can West Global. No, no, Globe and Mail. Well, Glo- oh, sorry, Globe and Mail, yes, yes. From the, the, the very, very extremely pro-liberal Globe and Mail. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the spokesperson from uh, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, Yara Sachs' office, said that while Ottawa does not provide court funding to supervise consumption sites, those sites do save lives. Quote, to be effective, these services need to be easily accessible by those who need them, which often means that they are located inside services they already access. We need a full continuum of care so people can stay alive to make it to recovery, which includes prevention, enforcement, treatment, and harm reduction. So there you go. Polyev's appeal comes days after the Montreal mayor, Valérie Plante, announced the city would mandate the Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal, the Office of Public Consultations in Montreal, to conduct public consultations on solutions to the homelessness crisis. The administration said it was seeking ways for residents to live more, quote, harmoniously with the unhoused population and provide more input on projects like these houses. On Friday, the conservative leader said that the concept of cohabitation was, quote, Orwellian terminology invented by politicians like Plant and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Asked how he would support people with addictions, Poliev said a conservative government would offer, quote, real treatment to end addiction rather than finance supervised consumption centers, but did not provide details about potential not. policy. Quote, the only solution is not to use hard drugs, oh, he said. Yes, because abstinence always works especially to someone who has an addiction. Just don't be addicted anymore. Stop being poor. You can do it. Stop having sex. What an asshole. That's what they told us in the HIV crisis. Just stop yeah, having sex. Mm-hmm. Sure, no problem. Have sex only to procreate, and this will never be a problem. Ugh. I just... Uh, A spokesperson for Quebec's health ministry said in an email Friday, the current public health crisis requires implementing, quote, pragmatic and humane solutions, and the ministry has chosen to, quote, take a collaborative approach. It is in the spirit that the regional health authority, the CIUS, du Centre Sud de l'Île de Montréal and its partners participate in a committee that works to, quote, inform, listen, and ensure the safety of citizens and workers in the sector. Some measures currently in place include deploying intervention workers near school grounds, having a team responsible for cleaning the premises, and increasing the presence of bicycle patrol officers during the summer. A spokesperson for Immigration Minister Mark Miller, whose writing includes Saint-Henri, said he has met with parents and neighbors in the area who expressed concern. He recognized the site lacks staff and there are still addiction issues and drug dealers in the area, but solutions need to be holistic. Harm reduction measures such as supervised injection sites are evidence-based and save lives, but it's important that they're done in the right way, Miller's spokesperson said in a statement. Polyev is instrumentalizing this issue to incite fear. He doesn't care about the parents or the importance of good neighborliness. He's hijacking their concerns for his own political That's motives. It. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. And again, okay, again, let's, uh, let's, let's go right back to the beginning. Ottawa does not fund this. So he's going to cut funding that he doesn't fund. He wants people to, to be ignorant about the fact that that's the case. He wants to close something that has nothing to do with the federal government. It is provincial and municipal. And then he calls them drug dens and he says, let's bring home our loved ones. Narcissist, lying, obnoxious, smug asshole. I do not want anybody like that near the highest office in this land. Mm -hmm. Now, um, according uh, to The Lancet, this was published in June, uh, June 14th, 2008. Uh, Vancouver safe injection site has been granted a reprieve from closure after a Supreme Court judge ruled that drug users were legally entitled to health care in the form of these facilities. The Canadian government has vowed to appeal the judgment. Yeah. That's what happened at the time. Uh, it was, uh, that was 2008, so that was the Harper government at the time. British Columbia's highest court has halted the Canadian government's plan to close InSight, North America's only government-sanctioned safe injection drug site for users. In a ruling on May 27, 2008, that the government immediately vowed to appeal, Justice Ian Pitfield of the Supreme Court of British Columbia concluded that the right to life provisions within the Canadian Constitution legally entitled drug users to health care in the form of safe injection facilities. In his ruling, Pitfield said he firmly rejected, quote, Canada's submission that addict must feed his addiction in an unsafe environment when a safe environment that may lead to rehabilitation is the alternative. 
Judge Pitfield cited support for Insight, which was established in 2003 and has supervised more than a million injections by 8,000 registered users. This was between 2003 and 2008. We're like 16 years later. From the Vancouver Police Department, along with medical evidence, the use of heroin, along with associated rates of hepatitis and HIV infections and overdoses, were at epidemic levels in Vancouver when Insight was established. According to a series of studies referenced in Pitfield's decision, this is the busiest injection site in the world, says Thomas Kier, co-principal investigation of a team studying Insight. The ruling comes in response to a legal appeal argued by Insight supporters against plans by Canada's Conservative government to use federal drug control laws to close the facility on June 30, 2008, at a time when the Conservatives are moving to harmonize Canadian drug control efforts with U.S. criminalization policies. Insight has been operating under a special exemption from Canadian drug control laws, which was originally granted by a Liberal federal government that later lost power to the Conservatives. The legal exemption to allow the facility to operate was granted in order to allow researchers to assess the site's effect on community health and safety in a section of central Vancouver where household incomes are 75% lower than the city's median average. A survey of 1,000 drug users in the area released in March found that 87% are infected with hepatitis C wow. virus, 17% with HIV. The survey also found that although 3% of the Canadian population is Aboriginal, 18% of Vancouver drug users are Aboriginal, and 59% reported a non-fatal overdose in their lifetime. Again, that was in 2008. Pre-fentanyl. Yeah. In his ruling, Judge Pitfield concluded that peer-reviewed data in studies of insight support, quote, the incontrovertible conclusions that, quote, drug addiction is an illness and that, quote, the risk of morbidity and mortality associated with addiction and injection is ameliorated by injection in the presence of qualified health professionals. Pitfield noted that 2,000 people are estimated to have died of overdoses in Vancouver in recent years. Heather Hay, Director of Addiction, HIV, AIDS, and Aboriginal Health Services for the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, testified that in the course of supervising 1 million injections at Insight, quote, staff have managed in excess of 1,000 overdoses without any resulting fatalities to death. Today, that number stands at about 55,000. It might be last number. I, I think the last number I heard was 55. Either way, they saved a lot of lives. Who knows? A lot of lives. Speaking to the Canadian Parliament after the decision was released, Federal Health Minister Tony Clement said he rejected Pitfield's judgment partly because of controversial assessment recently issued by the UN International Narcotics Control Board. Quote, these kinds of programs are not helpful, he said. That is what the United Nations thinks. Oh, yeah. then they believe to the United yeah. Nations. United Nations. At a hearing on May 29, 2000. Yes, at a hearing that they do that with the CBC too. The CBC is a terrible thing like this, but Trudeau's a terrible. Look at the CBC yeah. article. It says yeah. so. At a, at a hearing on May 29, 2008 in Ottawa, organized by the Canadian Parliament to analyze Canada's strategies on reduction of harm from drugs, Clement faced questions from opposition members of Parliament with backgrounds in public health. Citing 20 years' experience as a physician in central Vancouver, Dr. Hedy Fry noted that Insight has referred an average of 2,000 people to health services. In response, Clement said that an expert panel he convened recently found that Insight saved few, if any, lives and explained that harm reduction efforts will in future be managed within the scope of federal law enforcement strategies. He acknowledged that the expert panel's report was not pre-reviewed. We believe that harm reduction occurs with enforcement, with prevention, and with treatment. Supervised injection is not medicine, the Canadian health minister told Fry. Nobody ever said it was. It's a way to keep people alive long enough for them to realize that this kind of life is not working for them anymore and that they want it's, help. It saves Because you lives. can't help a corpse. It saves lives. Okay. And we have to remember also that that government, when they got like report after report after report after report after report, all saying the same thing, that this thing was good, they actually funded the RCMP to do their own research so that the RCMP could create a report that said that this was dangerous so that they could rely on that one and go to the media with that one and say, see, we've got something. They used your tax dollars to do that. This is not a new issue for Polyev. He was there yeah. for all of that. Yeah. This is a second kick at the can. This is, this is the safe injection sites is a, is a whipping horse yeah. for this party. It's, it's brutal. They just don't care. None of this no. is new. No. It's, uh, it's the, 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 uh, the right-wing evangelical bent that uh, they say, as, as Christians, which is a crock of shit, they, they basically hate right. people who have an addiction. They hate them. 
I mean, what else could you pull from that? We're going to bring them home and get them into, re, into, into, into treatment programs. It doesn't describe any of these programs, doesn't say how any of this is going to be done. He's just using bud, buzzwords to try and, well, rage farm because that's what he's doing. He's trying to create a wedge here. He's trying desperately to, to tell you that he knows better when he, his area of expertise again is what? <laughs> Being the yeah. shotgun. Yeah. Um, now there's much more plenty of news but unfortunately kids and cubs we are out of time we today uh, so uh, we are not skipping over uh, that which happened at the AFM. no no that we can address uh, off on Tuesday uh, yeah mm. yeah I, I have clips from that too because that yeah. oof, I, I was actually shocked ouch. out of my mind that he, he showed up in person is he is he that much of a, a uh, self-centered narcissist that believes that, oh, I'll just go there and everything will be okay? Or is he just a glutton for punishment? I, like, I don't get it. Like, I, 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 It must be, listen, as far as I know, anything he does, he does it for the yeah. clips. So how does he's going to use this? We'll find yeah, out. True enough. All righty. All right. Kids and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring, word of mouth is priceless, and you have mouths from which we want the word to come, so tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to support us because you do not want to miss an episode, for example, you can go to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, or you scan that QR code that just appeared under my chin. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you go there and you click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, I know if Kid Lane were here, she would say, hey, make sure you uh, have a terrific day and smash that button. So you can do that by going to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And we have like, share, and subscribe. Click those. Get yourself some happy. Why not? Sure. Treat yourself. Absolutely. And if you would like to support us in other ways, when we really appreciate it when you do, the QR code that's right by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to our coffee page where you will find our tip jar, otherwise known as the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. Because we need beer to make this show. Lots and lots and lots of beer. <laughs> and coffee. That's <laughs> well, just to cope with the news we have to uh, tell you some days. But uh, yeah. Oh, man. We need to cope. <laughs> oh man so if you scan the qr code there or uh go to coffee ko hyphen fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word and uh lighten your load of a few toonies or loonies we would be very 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 we, 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 we don't actually use the money to buy beer we use the money to give you a better show just for those who are just don't lie to well no if, if somebody's just tuning in for the first time like I buy beer. No, no, it goes no. towards the cost of, of hardware, equipment, microphones, stuff like that. I mean, I just, you know, these are new mics I had to buy for this. So it, it, it's, it's, it helps to cover the costs. I just, I just feel better about myself baking for beer rather than I know, but every now and then <laughs> rent money. Every now and then I need to, 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 to put some brevity into the situation and let people know that, you know, it's not actually for that. It, it is for our hardware costs, our software costs, our internet costs, and then it all adds up. The advertising, by the way, that's also a cost. So all of it is, is an expense, and, and uh, we're just trying to recover some of it is all it boils down to. Yeah, and hopefully build a little fun so we can take a little tour and events and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. So. We we do have yeah, we do have things stuff. in the works, uh, and I've got a couple of plans that. Uh, well, I'll tell you about later. Okay, excellent. Uh, so there you go. Help us out. We really appreciate that very much. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Again, if you live in Saskatchewan, British Columbia. Or New Brunswick elections are coming, so you know what to do. Mr. Grizzly, do you happen to have some words of wisdom for uh, us? Yeah. yeah. Try not to uh, allow uh, lying politicians to get away with the lies anymore. 
do what you can to inform your friends and neighbors that when you hear blatant falsehoods, that you, if you have the information, correct them. If you don't have the information, send them towards our channel where we're happy to provide it for them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right, Mr. Grizzly, cue the cock, and we'll come back with a little Easter egg. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, Easter egg. I wouldn't be me if I was not celebrating the fact that there's a Canadian in a Wimbledon final. Gabriella Dabrowski and her partner, Erin Rotliff. Erin Rotliff uh, has played for Canada mm -hmm. before, but she plays under the New Zealand flag right now. Uh, won their semifinal, and uh, their, fight, their final is at noon uh, today uh, against Taylor Townsend of the U.S. and Katarina Sinyakova. Ironically, uh, Sinyakova uh, took out Leila mm -hmm. Fernandez. No, not uh, Marina Stakusic in the first round. And Taylor Townsend was uh, Leila, Leila Andy Fernandez's partner last year, who they got to a, a final together. You know. uh, but uh, Dabrowski and Rotliff are the two of 2023 U.S. Open uh, doubles champions as well, which was their first title together at the Grand Slam. And uh, Dabrowski has uh, three Grand Slam titles to her own already, two in mixed doubles and one in doubles. So, uh, But Sinyakova has like God knows how many in doubles, I think eight or something. Oh, wow. She's like a, a doubles legend already, Hall of Fame career already. So uh, it's going to be a really interesting match. So uh, I'm going to be watching that. All I'll right. I'll be driving. I'll be driving. Are you uh, going to the the Red Blacks game? Yeah, I'm on my way to Edmonton later today. Uh, okay. I'm going to meet up with Lachlan and Army Chris and uh, oh. I'm going, going to the Red Blacks Elks game tomorrow afternoon. I can. I predict that you will be the most sober person of the three by the time that match is over. Maybe. <laughs> That's true. Yes, we're not recording tomorrow, so you can let yourself go. Exactly. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Grizzly on vacation. Grizzly on vacation. <laughs> All right, but picks, but it didn't. Picks or it didn't happen. Yeah, That's all I'm saying. Worry. All right. I, I'll get some video too. I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>